walk across campus without seeing someone you love. Even on the days you want to avoid everyone, that one person that you kind of know will smile at you from across the quad. When I got here, I planned to fade into the background. I wanted to remain invisible and just get my diploma and move on. But MC, the staff, the students, they saw that I had more potential than that. They noticed that I had the qualities of a leader and encouraged me to grow in them. So they pushed me to mature as a leader, but it didn't stop there. They encouraged all of me, not just part of me. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Oklahoma, and um, I teach physics, and I also do physics research. And it wouldn't be fair to you if I didn't tell you a little bit about my research. And so I'm going to do that first, and then we're going to talk about this subject, do science and the Bible conflict. So I am a professor. You'll want to take notes. There will be a quiz at the end, and so make sure you get this down. You all know that the universe is made of atoms, and atoms have at their center something called the nucleus. Or, and nuclei are made of neutrons and protons, and neutrons and protons are made of things called quarks. People come to me and say, I've never heard of quarks. When were they discovered? 1974. So you should know about them. Don't just you know, be satisfied when your chemistry teacher tells you the world is made of neutrons and protons. Make sure you know it's made of quarks. But anyway, I spend my life studying the structure of the proton, the quarks inside the proton. Now, suppose I want to know what the proton is made of. Suppose you wanted to know what your car was made of. And you, didn't have, you had no tools to take your car apart, no screwdrivers or wrenches or pliers. What would you do to figure out how your car is made? Well, you'd get it going really fast, and you'd smash it against another car. And when it does it, it breaks into smaller pieces. Um, if you can drive a, and you have a car, you should probably do this with your parents' car, because you really don't want to smash your car. But this is what we do. At a laboratory near Geneva, Switzerland, there's a tunnel underneath the ground that's 17 miles around. And inside that tunnel, we build these big superconducting magnets. And inside those magnets, we accelerate trillions and trillions of protons to nearly the speed of light. And we get them going one way, and then we get them going another way. Um, and inside a few different places, at certain points, we smash the protons together, and they break into smaller pieces, and we see what they're made of. The, de the detector that sees the debris from these collisions that I work on is called the Atlas detector. Here's kind of a drawing of it, and here's another drawing of it. If you look at the very bottom of the picture, you see the size of people compared to this detector. This thing is gigantic, so the protons come in one way through a pipe, and they come in the other way from the, through a pipe going the speed of light. They smash together, and, in, and the computer takes pictures that look like this, and from these pictures, we can understand the structure of the universe. So I spent six years as a graduate student and seven years as a postdoctoral researcher so I could understand pictures like this. Now, my dad's already said it, what a waste of time, so you don't have to say it, okay? But no, actually, it's quite remarkable that we can understand the structure of the universe by smashing protons together. So that's what I do in my professional life. Um, but I also talk a lot about science and the Bible. And you might ask, why are we going to talk about such a subject at a conference on truth? And the reason is because as Christians, we believe that there is truth, as we heard Dr. Turk say, and that the Bible is a source of truth. It's God-inspired word. And that when it speaks about science, it should also reveal truth. But there's a perception today that there's a conflict between the Bible and scientific discoveries. Because I'm a scientist, students will come to my office, they'll ask me questions, and the questions are like this. Um, isn't science based on facts and the Bible is based on faith? We heard what, a little bit about faith in the previous discussion. You know, are the Big Bang or evolution compatible with the Bible? Is there any real evidence to support them? How old is the earth? How old is the universe? Does science rule out miracles? And there's lots of other questions that people have. Now, we can't touch on all those questions this morning, but we're going to try to touch on some of them. Um, you may have questions similar to this that affect your faith. For some people, these kinds of questions are important. For other people, these kinds of questions are not necessarily important. But even if they're not important for you, I encourage you to listen, take notes, learn some things, because you probably have friends colleagues, family members, who these types of questions are a barrier to their faith. That they're struggling with, can I believe Christianity because doesn't Christianity conflict with science and isn't science the only way to know truth, as some people might believe. 
So um, it's interesting that Dr. Turk said at the beginning of his talk that it was controversial. My talk is also controversial. That's a good thing. Um, and you may hear something new. And so I like to take you back a step and say, what should you do with things that you don't agree with? Well, as Christians, um, some guy who was an archbishop of Spalato, I can't pronounce his name, but he said, in essentials, unity. There are certain things about the Christian faith we all have to agree on. The Bible being God's word, salvation by grace through faith, the deity of Christ. And there are other things that are not essential, like how old the universe is. And in those things we show diversity, and in all things we show charity, which is an old word for love. We continue to love each other. Jesus made a remarkable statement. He said, by this will all people know that you are my disciples, if you believe exactly the same thing about science in the Bible. Right? Is that what he said? Of course not. He said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. So you may not agree with everything I say today, but we'll continue to love each other and discuss these things in our search for truth. So why is this subject important to discuss? Well, for non-Christians, I know some who immediately dismiss Christianity. If the Bible says this and science says this, then why should I even consider that as a worldview? I go out to lunch with a few of my colleagues every Thursday. Um, my people who are also high energy physicists. I know you'd love to be a fly on the table listening to our physics talk. Um, but anyway, we talk about everything. Of course, we're in Oklahoma, so we talk about OU football. We talk about our students. We say Oklahoma University would be a great place to work if it wasn't for the students. But um, you know, we say things like that. And, and, but I once brought up, how can we talk about everything, but we never talk about religion? And one of my colleagues looked me in the eye and said, because religion's not worth talking about, right? Why should we even discuss this as a worldview? Because isn't it just, you know, a bunch of beliefs that no one really holds with any evidence? But for Christians, I find there's other problems. Some Christians dismiss science. Oh, we can't believe the science because those are fallible men trying to find the truth in fallible methods. And so there's a whole bunch of things from science that point to God, and sometimes Christians just dismiss those. Other Christians compartmentalize. Jesus said, the greatest commandment of all, that's a pretty important thing, the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. And I'm so glad he said mind, because what it means is we need to love God with all of our being. We need to be able to ask tough questions and get reasonable answers. We need to love God with our mind. And so don't, you know, I, um, well, the last one I'll talk about, and then we'll come back to this. Some people even choose to no longer follow Jesus. I had a student come into my office, his name was Rob. Rob said he was brought up in a church, uh, very much like the story uh, Dr. Turk told. Um, he was brought up in a church, he was taught the Bible, said this about science. He got to the University of Oklahoma and it was clear that what he was learning in his science classes contradicted what he had been taught in the Bible. And he said the only conclusion he could draw was that the Bible wasn't true. So Rob said, you know, he decided that he kind of liked um, his church friend, so he would go to church on Sunday, but other than that, he would not follow God. And, and Rob's thinking was absolutely correct. If what the Bible says is false about creation and origins and things like that, then why should I believe it when it speaks about other things? Um, fortunately, someone gave Rob a book that explained how science and Christianity and the Bible and science all meshed together, and it changed his life. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We know there can't be any real conflict. Why? Because um, the Bible and the science had the same author. God inspired the word of his word, and he created um, the universe. So ultimately, the truth we find in nature must agree with the truth we find in the Bible, because God's a God of all truth. Um, we know God reveals himself in nature. The Bible says that. When you look at nature, the heavens should declare the glory of God. The sky should sow the work of his hands. And Romans 1.20, one of my favorite verses on science in the Bible and Christianity, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How does God reveal himself in nature and how does that revelation agree with what the Bible says. Now, I have a bunch of questions. Dr. Turk had four. I can outdo him. I have five or six. Um, but I don't know that I'll get to all of them. So we'll see what we can get to, and we'll look at these five or six or four questions 
about the relationship between Bible and science, and we'll explore how they have complementary truth. So the first one is kind of philosophical. It goes along with the previous talk. The question is, isn't science based on objective evidence and faith based on subjective feelings? You kind of heard a little bit about that in the previous talk. Richard Dawkins, the atheistic biologist, says faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of, perhaps even because of, the lack of evidence. Now, that's the worst definition of biblical faith I've ever heard. But most people think that's what faith is, believing something without evidence. But that's not true. In 1 Corinthians um, 15, Paul talks about the fact that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain and we should be pitied. He said, if this event didn't happen, if it's not objectively true, then we're wasting our time here. And, and Thomas, Thomas is the patron saint of all scientists. So Thomas said, I'm not going to believe Jesus rose from the dead unless I see the evidence. And what did Jesus say? You stupid idiot. Why do you need evidence? No, he went up to Thomas and he said, here are the nail prints in my hand and the spear scar on my side. Look at the evidence and believe. Paul writes to the Thessalonians to test everything and hold on to what is good. And as we saw in Mark, Jesus says to love the Lord your God with your mind. Christian faith is not because there's no evidence. It's because the evidence is overwhelming. Is it science based on objective evidence and faith based on subjective feelings? No. Biblical faith is trusting God because he's shown himself to be trustworthy. It's always based on evidence. John Lennox, the famous Oxford mathematician, says this so clearly. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It's the exact opposite. It's a commitment based on evidence. It's that faith in because we have faith um, about the things we know or because we know these things are true based on the evidence. It's trusting God. It's, it's not just believing that a chair can support me. It's sitting in the chair because the evidence that the chair can support me is so strong. That's Christian faith. Let's move on to the second question. Is the Big Bang an atheistic theory? Because the Big Bang is one of these hot topics we don't talk about. It must be a dirty word. Um, so my kids are grown up now, but when my kids were young, I used to go out you know, on an evening with my wife, which was really nice when my kids are young, and um, we'd go. I'd, I'd have a babysitter watch my kids. And usually these babysitters were teenage girls who were brought up in the church, and I'd go pick them up in my car and drive them back to the house, you know, really intimidating. You're with the father of the person you're going to babysit, and he's asking you all these questions, and, you know, I'd give them all the, um, the babysitting questions. But I'd ask these, these teenage girls who grew up in great Christian homes this question. Do you think the Big Bang is an atheistic theory or a theistic theory? Does it point to God or point away from God? Now, that's not normally one of your babysitting, uh, you know, criteria questions, but I'm a scientist, and every answer was the same. Oh, that's an atheistic theory. It points away from God. Let's, let's explore that question. Well, prior to 1929, most scientists thought the universe was eternal. It had always existed. It was infinite in size and time, but in 1929, Edwin Hubble made a discovery. He discovered that the universe was like raisin bread. Right? So here's a picture of raisin bread in the oven rising. And notice that as the raisin bread gets bigger, all the raisins get farther apart. Well, Hubble really didn't discover raisin bread. He discovered that the galaxies in the universe were moving farther apart. And if the galaxies are moving farther apart, you can make a conclusion. In fact, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Well, I guess he was a rocket scientist. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make the conclusion. And that is, if the universe is expanding now, it must have started to expand. It must have had a beginning. An expanding universe implies that the universe had a beginning in what we call the Big Bang. And that idea was not really um, accepted by the scientific community. Arthur Eddington said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Now, why is the idea that the universe had a beginning repugnant to scientists? Is it because it's true or not? No, it's because if the universe had a beginning, it might have had a beginner. And that's the idea that's repugnant to some people. But every scientist you, you come across now accepts the Big Bang. 
even though philosophically it's repugnant, we all believe it's true because the evidence was so overwhelming. The evidence comes in three kinds. The universe is expanding. It must have started to expand. Um, we can predict how much helium and hydrogen should be in the universe. And what we predict based on the Big Bang is exactly what we see to one part in 10,000. It's remarkable. And then third, this, this is what the quiz will be about, by the way, so make sure you take good notes. Why do we know the Big Bang is true? Um, that's a joke. Um, but anyway, the temperature of the universe is the third reason. What do you mean by the temperature of the universe? Well, the universe started out really hot. It's like you go into your kitchen and you turn the oven on and you get it really, really hot. And then you turn the oven off and you open the door to the oven and you leave the house and you come back. And a few hours later, the whole house is just a little bit warmer because the oven was really hot at one time. Well, we think the universe started out really hot and it's been cooling ever since. And if this happened, we should still see the leftover heat. And quite a while ago, in 1964, two scientists discovered this leftover heat. It's called the, called the cosmic background microwave radiation. And again, what we think happened with the Big Bang, our theoretical models agree with the experimental evidence to one part in 10,000. It's a remarkable theory. Um, the, the correlation between the theory and the evidence is so strong that it caused scientists to accept that the universe had a beginning even though the philosophical ideas, uh, the philosophical baggage was so great. So um, everything we know, Einstein's special or general theory of relativity that describes gravity and all the observations say that the Big Bang was the origin of everything we know, the beginning of space, time, matter, and energy. There's no bang. There's nothing there to bang. There's no explosion of pre-existing stuff. Nothing was there. It's the origin, the creation of space, time, matter, and energy. That's the Big Bang. Right? So that's a problem if you don't believe in God. One physicist wrote, the biggest problem with the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe is philosophical, perhaps even theological. What was there before the bang? You see, if the universe had a beginning, if everything we know in the universe had a beginning, then whatever or whoever started it can't be a part of this universe. That beginner must be transcendent outside the universe. Have you ever heard of a transcendent creator before? Right? Of course you have. That's what Christians have been saying long ago. And in fact, scientists understood the theological implications of this. This was a quote from an agnostic physicist about the Big Bang. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak, and as he pulls himself over the rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Right? The theologians have been saying all along the universe had a beginning, and now science says the universe has a beginning. In fact, it's quite remarkable that over the last century, what we've observed in science is exact about the origin of the universe. What we've observed in science about the origin of the universe is exactly what the Bible said centuries ago. First, the universe had a beginning. The very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Second, that the stuff of the universe did not exist at one time. The writer of the Hebrew said, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so what, that what is seen is, was not made out of what was visible. In fact, the things we see now did not come from some pre-existing stuff that was visible. And science now confirms this. But even maybe more amazing is that the Bible is the only holy book in the world that talks about the creator, that explicitly talks about the creator existing before time. Paul wrote that grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Now, I have no clue what it means to not have time. But the Big Bang says time itself came to existence. So whoever started this universe must live outside of time. And Paul, for some reason, understood that and wrote that, that God was acting before he created time. So these things that we've discovered from scientific observation of the universe, from the beginning, from the origin, from the Big Bang, are exactly what the Bible said. The question is, is the Big Bang an atheistic theory? The answer is no. The Big Bang points to a transcendent creator. It's the best evidence for God 
other than the resurrection of Jesus. The best objective evidence for God, in my opinion, other than the resurrection, is the origin of the universe. Arno Penzias, who won the Nobel Prize for finding the cosmic background radiation, said the best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible as a whole. The Big Bang is a theistic theory. Even if you don't believe in the Big Bang because of your Christian beliefs, you should know that it points to God so that your friends who already believe it and don't know the philosophical implications, you can use that. You can turn the question around. Do you believe in the Big Bang? Well, of course. Well, do you know the implications that our universe had a beginning? That there's a beginner out there who's transcendent. Um, and there's a whole lot more we could get from the Big Bang, but I want to go to some other questions. The third question, do all Christians who believe the Bible agree on God's method of creation? And the answer is no. This is one of the controversial things. And I want to ask three questions. Did God create the universe? Did God use the Big Bang to create the universe? And then finally, is macroscopic evolution true? We'll, we'll come back to this later, but macroscopic evolution is the idea that we all evolved from a common ancestor. That um, all, you know, that we started with a single cell animal or whatever, and then gradually through the process of random mutation and natural selection, all of life formed. And so Christians have lots of different views on this. There are people we call young earth creationists. And young earth creationists believe that the universe is about six to 10,000 years old. And they would answer the question, did God create the universe? Yes, he did. Did God use the Big Bang to create the universe? No, he didn't. Does God use macroscopic evolution to create our bodies, humans? And they would say no. And then there's another group of Christians we might call old earth creationists or progressive creationists. And they would ask, answer the question this way, is God the creator? Yes. Did the Big Bang occur? Is that how God created the universe 14 billion years ago? And they would say yes. And the question, but did God then use evolution to create our physical bodies? That they would say no. So some people think if you believe in the Big Bang, you automatically believe in evolution. But those are two very different questions. And many, many Christians believe the Big Bang because of the overwhelming evidence, but still don't believe that evolution occurred. But there are even Christians we would call theistic evolutionists. Theistic means God, that God used evolution to create humans. And they would answer the question, is God the creator? Yes. Did the Big Bang occur? Is that how God made the universe? Yes. And did God use evolution to create humans? And they would say yes. Um, and then, of course, there's a fourth category, which is naturalistic evolution, people who don't believe in God. And that's the biggest difference. The biggest difference is the first question. Did God do it or didn't he? Now, if I was on a high school debate team, and you asked me just from the Bible, not from science, but just from the Bible to defend any of the first three views, I could probably do it. Any of the first three could be valid interpretations of the account of creation. So as a good debater, I could tell you why there's good reasons to believe any of the first three views. So they're all biblical. It's not if you believe the Bible, you hold a view X, Y, or Z. It's Christians who believe the Bible hold to all these different views. And, and that's important because if Rob had known that, he wouldn't have come to my office and say what he was taught in church conflicts with what he's learning in science. He would have said, wow, I've got options. Which of these is most closely related to scripture and science? Which of these make the two mesh better? But unfortunately, he was not never told that Christians believe different things about how God created the universe and humans. But they do. Right? Um, and, I, and I think you can handle that truth. Right? All right, so do Christians who believe the Bible agree on God's method of creation? No. Bible-believing Christians disagree on God's method for creating the universe and creating humans. The great theologian Schofield said, Scripture gives no data for determining how long ago the universe was created. We have to look elsewhere for the data because Scripture doesn't tell us. Right? So this is the biggest one I get questions about, probably. And I'm going to spend quite a, a little bit of time on this. Does the account of creation in Genesis disagree with scientific discoveries? I mean, after all, doesn't the Bible say the universe was created in six days? And don't scientists say the universe is 14 billion years old? 
How can those agree? And then second, the order of creation in the Bible is so weird. You got light on the first day and the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day. How does this all work? Can, can these really agree? So the first thing I want to talk about, and, and I want to tell you one way they might agree. Again, Christians have different views. I want to tell you one possible way that I think science and the account of Genesis mesh together. And we're going to start with the word day. The Hebrew word that we translate day is yom. And just like in English, the Hebrew word yom has lots of meanings. So let me, let me try your English. If I tell you, um, in George Washington's day, the colonists fought the British in the Revolutionary War. What do I mean by the word day? In George Washington's day, the colonists fought the British. I mean some long period of time, right? They didn't fight them in one 24-hour period. If I say this, it's a beautiful day outside. What do I mean? Think about it. Most people get this one wrong. I mean right this moment, right? We might have had a tornado coming through an hour ago. We have those all the time in Oklahoma. But right now the sun is shining. It's beautiful. So in that context, the word day means this moment. Now, ancient Hebrew is an interesting language because English has about a million words. But ancient Hebrew has about 3,000 words, a million to 3,000. And ancient Hebrew, in which Genesis was written in, does not have a word that means a long period of time, like our word epic or era. If you wanted to write that God created the universe in six periods of time, you would say six days. That's the best word to use. So that's one of the views. Um, I think we'll just skip that. So one of the greatest um, Hebrew scholars of the 20th century who understood ancient Hebrew was a guy named Gleason Archer. And Gleason Archer writes, on the basis of internal evidence, by looking at the Bible, it is this writer's conviction that Yom in Genesis 1 could not have been intended by the Hebrew author to mean a literal 24-hour day. So I don't know ancient Hebrew. Maybe some of you read it. Maybe that's what you do in the morning. First thing you get up, get your coffee and read ancient Hebrew. But Gleason Archer does. And he tells me that even though my English translation seems to make it look like a 24-hour day, if you were reading ancient Hebrew, that's not what you would pick up. And so what does the day mean? Well, there's lots of ideas. There are at least 11 possibilities that good biblical scholars think the word means. One is that it is 24 hours. One is that the six days of creation are like just a, what we call framework. They're not like an outline. Roman numeral one is day one, and Roman numeral two is day two. One is that they're called analogical days. We really don't know. God's days are not our days. God keeps time different than us. And then one is this thing called the day-age theory, that each day is a long period of time. And I just want to go into that one in a little more detail, because um, I know atheists who, because they've seen Genesis 1 in the day-age theory, have eventually become Christians. And so I don't know what the original author meant for sure, but this, this day-age theory meshes so well that I at least want to expose you to it if you've never heard about it. So in the day-age view, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And science would tell us that took about 9 billion years to create the stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, the heavens, and the earth. So that's about 9 billion years. And then we get Genesis 1-2, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And then we get Genesis 1-3 and forward, which talks about the earth. God preparing the earth for humans. So the rest of Genesis 1 takes about 4.5 billion years. And each day, each day is somewhere about a half a billion years or so. Okay? So let's look at the Bible. Let's not look at science. Let's look at what the Bible really says. When I was studying this on my own to try to find the truth, what I found is that what people told me the Bible said was not always what the Bible said. And by reading it for myself, I was able to form some of my own conclusions. So here's the first thing. People often skip Genesis 1-2, but it's the key verse. If you skip Genesis 1-2, you miss everything. Genesis 1-2 says, And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So let's see what it says and what it doesn't say. First, it only states that there was darkness on the surface of the deep. That's on the surface of the earth. It doesn't say the universe was dark. Most people think there's no light anywhere in the universe, but it doesn't say that. 
He says it's dark on the earth. Okay, we'll get back to that. It says the earth is formless and void and water co covers its surface. So if you were going to go back to the earth four and a half billion years ago when it was first um, formed, this would be the perfect description of it. It's formless, void, it's watery, and it's dark. Why is it dark? Is it dark because there is no sun and moon and stars out there? No, they're out there, they're burning brightly. But on the surface of the earth, there would be so much dust and debris and material in outer space that it would completely block the sun, it would be dark. Just as the Bible says, it doesn't say it's dark everywhere. It says it's dark on the surface of the earth, and that is where it would have been dark four and a half billion years ago. So now we're going to look at what happens starting from on the surface of the earth. So here, here's my statement. From a perspective on the surface of the earth, where the Spirit of God is moving, the Spirit of God is, is located at the surface of the earth, the story recorded in Genesis 1 remarkably follows the order of events as described by current scientific theories. So let's walk through those six days of creation. Day one, God says, let there be light, and there is light. Where is there light? On the surface of the earth. So the early atmosphere changes from completely dark to what we call translucent. It allows light to come through. So all this junk in outer space begins to settle. And on the earth, you would see light and darkness. You would see day and night. You'd never see the sun and the moon and stars. It's just like a cloudy day or a cloudy night, but you would know it's day and night. And what does the Bible say? God says, let there be light and there is light and the, day, the light he called day and the dark he called night. That's what you would see on the surface of the earth about four billion years ago. Day two, God separates the waters above from the waters below. What's the waters above? Clouds. What's the waters below? Ocean. You start a water cycle. That's the next thing that happens. Some people teach this as some kind of weird waters above, but if you read it straight forward, what would you read if you said God made the waters above and the waters below and he put a sky in between them? Clouds and, and oceans. Day three, God creates dry land and plants form. So the mostly watery planet develops continents. Now, about a few years ago, I was reading a book called Rare Earth, written by two scientists at the University of Washington. They're not Christians, they're not religious, they're not believers, but they had a super great plot that I stole from them. Okay, so here's a plot. And on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, you have the, the age of the earth, four and a half billion years old, so the time since the earth formed. And on the y-axis, you have the amount of land on the earth. So on the far right is where we live now, way over to the right, and that shows you that now we have what's called 100% of the land. So the amount of land we have now, which covers about a third of the earth. So notice when the earth was formed, how much land is there? There's almost none, it's all a watery planet. And it says, and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters, because the planet's all water. And then sometime about one and a half billion years after the earth was formed, you go from mostly watery planet, see that steep rise, to mostly a land planet. And I was shocked. I was reading a book by secular scientists about the, the earth being formed over the last four and a half billion years, and they told me when day three occurred. Because God said the continents were formed on day three, and there they are, going from a watery planet to a land planet. Science shows that there's a time, a short period of time geologically, where God said, you know, let the continents be formed. And there they are, in, in plain black and white from scientific viewpoint. So day four, God says the sun to have the sun and the moon and stars appear. Now this always freaked me out. How can you have light on day one if the sun, moon, and stars don't come on day till day four? But now it makes sense. On the surface of the earth, it was dark. Then finally you could see the light, and then finally... Billions of years later, everything clears up enough so you can finally see the sun, moon, and stars. Um, and this is exactly what the, t the language of the text says. Ancient Hebrew doesn't have a past tense. They have what's called a completed tense. You could translate it, it's already done. And that's what it says about the sun, moon, and stars in verse, in, on day four, I think it's verse 14. It says, they had been created. 
So God said, let them appear, let them be for signs and for seasons. Why? Because he had made them already. And they finally appear in the sky from the surface of the earth. On day five, God creates sea life and birds and sea mammals. The Bible doesn't give every detail of creation. Um, and it, it lists primarily the creatures that are important for humans. And so these are primarily the kinds of sea animals that humans would fish and the birds that they would interact with. And then on day six, God creates land animals. And again, I don't think every animal is mentioned in the Bible. The words for cattle and beasts usually refer to the kind of animals that humans interact with, the kind they domesticate, the kind they hunt. So I don't think dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible. In my view, they were died out long before humans came along, and they're just not mentioned. And then finally, finally on day six, God creates humans, and humans are unique. We're unique because we have a spirit that can commune with God. What makes me unique as a human? Is it that I use language? Well, dolphins use some kind of language. Is it that I use tools? Well, chimpanzees use simple tools. What makes me unique is that, as Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in me that only Jesus Christ can fill. And God created humans uniquely. They're the last thing created, and science tells us that. There's been no change since humans came along the planet, we don't know exactly when, 50,000 years ago maybe, but since humans came along, we're the last greatest creation of God. So the order of creation is perfect. You start with the creation of the heavens and earth. The earth is formless and void and dark, not anything else. Light appears on the surface of the earth. The water cycle begins, continents form, plants are, come from the ground. The atmosphere becomes transparent, and you can finally see the sun, moon, and stars. The fish and the birds fill the sea and the air. Higher life forms fill the sea, and then mammals that man interacts with are created, and finally God creates man. Now, some of you may have heard of Dr. Hugh Ross. He's a Christian now, but he wasn't. He was an atheist. And somebody challenged him to read the Bible's account of creation. And all he, all he knew at the time was evolution. All he knew at the time was the Big Bang. And he read Genesis 1, and it started him on a journey to become a Christian, which he is now. And here's why. He says, the first page of the Bible caught my attention. Not only did its author correctly describe the major events in the creation of life on earth, but he placed those events in the scientifically correct order. How could someone 3,400 years ago write a book that puts things in the correct order when told from the surface of the earth. That got this guy thinking, there must be something special about this book. So, um, does the account of creation Genesis disagree? No, it doesn't. It really lines up perfectly. Now, is this the only proper way to interpret Genesis? I don't know, probably not. But it's one way that good scholars say works. And, and as a scientist, it fits so nicely. You don't have to say, does the account of creation disagree with what science says? The account of creation agrees with what science says. And whether it's exactly this way of meshing the two or another one, I'm not sure, but I like this one. It works. I don't have much time, but evolution always comes up. What about evolution? We already said, you know, that there are Christians who believe in evolution. Um, and this is one of the most controversial things, and I, um, different Christians believe different things. I'm not a geneticist, I'm a physicist. I'm not a biologist, I'm a physicist. And so anything I say on this subject comes from my scientific understanding. Most Christians who are geneticists probably are theistic evolutionists. But there's a lot of misinformation. Um, so what is evolution? It can mean lots of different things. It can mean change over time. Well, things change over time. If evolution just changed over time, then of course it happened. Um, there's something called macros microscopic evolution, that bacteria can be become resistant to disease. Well, everyone believes that happens. And then there's something called macroscopic evolution. We've already defined that. That's that we all share a common ancestor. It's the tree of life. That we all are related genetically. That things change from one species to another. Um, and that's a different thing. Now, most scientists think that macroscopic evolution is just microscopic evolution over time. Given enough time, little changes will become big. But as a physicist, I've looked at the evidence and I don't think it's very compelling. 
I think change over time happens. I think microscopic evolution happens. But to take the jump that those little changes over time produce big changes, in my opinion, there's not a lot of evidence. So I think we'll, we'll skip, there's a lot of things here, but I think we'll skip to the punchline here. Can macroscopic evolution be biblical? Some Christians say no, but some Christians believe in evolution. One idea is that God used evolution to create our physical bodies, but then he took Adam and Eve and he breathed in them the breath of life and he made in them spiritual beings. And this is an idea C.S. Lewis presents in The Problem of Pain. Now, you all know how your physical body was created. If you don't, come talk to me afterwards, all right? We'll explain it. It was a, it was a natural process. So maybe the first physical bodies were also created naturally through some process, and God's responsible for that. I'm not saying God's not responsible. It's a possibility. C.S. Lewis poses a possibility. Um, but, but currently, I don't believe it because of the scientific problem. So let me just end with this. What about evolution? Is there really evidence for it? Does it contradict the Bible? My thought is that it could be biblical, but it has lots of scientific problems. Francis Collins is a, the is a Christian who's a theistic evolutionist. He believed God used evolution. He says the God of the Bible is the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. His creation is majestic, awesome, intricate, and beautiful. So I'm going to skip question number six and go right to the end. I've answered five questions about science in the Bible. Biblical faith is trusting God. It's, not, it's always based on evidence. The Big Bang is a theistic theory. It points to a transcendent creator. Christians who believe in the Bible have different views on this. But the story of creation from the surface of the earth, the day-age view, works perfectly. And then macroscopic evolution might be biblical, but it hasn't yet passed the test of science as far as I'm concerned. So why does this matter? Well, if you don't believe in God, the, the message to you should be you can ask questions, tough questions about Christianity, and expect reasonable, thoughtful answers. The Bible's a reliable book. You should read it for yourself. You should see what it has to say rather than what somebody else told you it has to say. Um, and then as a, not, as a believer, you can also ask important and difficult questions and expect reasonable answers. And you can also expect that the author of science, the author of nature, is the author of, God's, of his word, and that the character you see should agree in both. And finally, therefore, if you're struggling with, can I trust God because is the Bible reliable? Let me assure you, you can. You can trust God, you can trust his word, and you can commit your life to him because he's trustworthy. That's what biblical faith is. Thanks. Mm -hmm.